I have Neuro Coffee in hand and yes, it is perfect. All right. Wow, great day. Can't wait to get outside. Gonna move around a little bit um, before I head into iFast today. iFast opened yesterday. If you, if you haven't um, scheduled your next appointment, please do so. So we appreciate you. We're, it was very exciting to have a bunch of people back and, and uh, many of them were quite happy. Lots of smiles yesterday. So again, another great day in store. Got a Q&A uh, question, actually probably two questions <clears throat> coming from Rachel. So Rachel breaks this up in, into a couple uh, hip questions. And she says, what super mus superficial muscle activity and compensatory strategies would drive lateral orientation of the hips and how might this present itself? And then she asks, what would we expect to see for a more rightward orientation of the pelvis? And so let's, let's just break this up into a couple, uh, couple different segments. Let's look at the, the normal motions of the hip and then how we would get this oriented into a, a more lateral orientation. So Rachel, I'm gonna make an assumption that you're talking about the, the, the hip socket, the acetabulum pointing more laterally. So let me grab the pelvis here. So if we look at the, the pelvis from the side, so for us to access full excursion of the hip joint, I have to be able to inhale and exhale. And so that changes the orientation. Of the retroverted hip socket's gonna help us capture ER. The antiverted hip socket's gonna help us capture the, the IR. And so for someone to have a laterally oriented acetabulum, what has to happen under those circumstances is I'm most likely going to experience some form of compressive strategy on the posterior aspect and some form of compressive strategy that's going to be on the anterior aspect. So I'm squeezing the pelvis front to back and then I'm gonna get kind of stuck in the middle because if I can move volume in the pelvis forward, I'll have my internal rotation. If I can move volume backward, I'll have my, my external rotation. So again, to get stuck in the middle, I'll have to compress on both sides. And so that's typically what we're going to see under the circumstances of someone that would be more laterally oriented. The dead giveaway, of course, is that if I'm compressed on the front side, I lose my IR. If I'm compressed on the back side, I lose my ER. So what you're gonna see is you're gonna see some form of orientation starting to take place where we're gonna lose the physiological motion of the hip. So under most circumstances, if we say that external rotation is 60 degrees, internal rotation is 40 degrees, our numbers are going to be less than those standards of, of normal range of motion when we get this, this lateralization. So let me give, for instance, I've measured power lifters that are really, really strong guys that have given up a lot of hip range of motion for their craft, and they might have 20 degrees of external rotation and 10 degrees of, of internal rotation because they're very, very oriented uh, laterally because of the amount of compression that they have to use to lift such, such heavy weights that they give up that range of motion. Now, if we go to the second half, and you asked, um, what would we see in a more rightward orientation? So when we talk about orientations, Rachel, we're gonna talk about the pelvis moving as a single unit. So an orientation forward would be the entire pelvis, so the sacrum and the ilium moving together, uh, posteriorly or anteriorly. When we talk about an orientation to the right, we can have any number of tilts and turns because I have these two hip sockets here, and so I have a way that I can move any number of different orientations um, because of, again, just the, the shape of, of, of the sockets themselves. Now, that means that I could have a relative position change into exhalation, so I could have a nutated sacrum with an IR at ilium and then have the orientation tipping on an oblique axis or, or straight ahead typically going to be, be, be trying to, to manage internal forces, we'll get that right orientation. I could have a relative position change where I have a counter nutation of the sacrum, sacrum with an ER at ilium and then see the orientations as well. And under those circumstances, my internal rotations and my external rotations are going to be different. And that's how you would know. So you could also use your ISA measure as a clue as to whether I'm starting from my inhaled position where I have lots of ER and then orient, or I have my nutated position, which I'm exhaled, and then I capture the orientation. So I would, I would go from a position where I had more IR and I would eventually lose that IR. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea. Oh, let me back up. I could also have 
that where I have um, an inhaled position on one side, exhale position on the other, and then drive the, the orientations. So again, I, I think that um, understanding the normal excursion of, of the hip joint as it moves through the, the full excursion of breathing is essential. So you do understand how you capture those motions. And then it's just a matter of looking at um, ISA orientation will help you determine where their bias is. And then you look at wh whether I'm losing the physiological range of the hip range of motion to determine whether you have an orientation. So if you put all those pieces together, I think it'll, it'll help you with your, with your diagnostic capabilities as two positions. Rachel, great question. If you have any other questions, please let me know. AskBillHartman at gmail.com. AskBillHartman at gmail.com. And I will see you guys tomorrow.